you, Dimitri, as we said before, 10 years as a deputy district attorney, uh, many years since as a well-known, well-regarded trial lawyer out there and also professor. Uh, Dimitri, how about, let, let's start off with the idea of, of last witness for the prosecution being this sort of wrap-up witness for all the forensics, going to put it all in one big package and lay it in the laps of the jurors. What do you think about that? I think that's uh, the right strategy for Mr. Jackson. Mr. I, you know, I did work like Mr. Jackson for many years, and you kind of want to close off your case with a bang. Somebody who's going to bring in all the prior uh, evidence, so to speak, in the jury's mind about the prior violence, about what Mr. D'Souza said, and actually use the, scientist, the science behind um, what happened in that house to support the testimony of Mr. D'Souza, as well as the prior violence evidence. What Mr. Jackson is doing here is putting the pieces of the puzzle together of the forensics to demonstrate to the jury how the forensics support what Mr. D'Souza observed, as well as support what the prior uh, women testified about Mr. Spector's prior acts of violence when he's been drinking. Sometimes we'll hear, Dimitri, when, especially when an expert is on the stand for a long period of time, you might hear some email from the viewers saying, well, this is kind of boring. My thought has always been, and I, I was like you, was a prosecutor for a number of years and a defense lawyer for a number of years, that jurors really engage themselves with these experts, much more so than even people who are sitting in the gallery, uh, even if it's very detailed and very lengthy expert testimony. Do you think that's the case? I think jurors want to be involved 100% in the analysis of this forensic evidence. I know that um, in the O.J. Simpson case, um, a lot of the jurors felt there was, you know, they were taken for granted that things didn't need to be spelled out for them as much. They do want to uh, get involved in the forensic evidence. They do understand uh, what the forensic evidence is, especially when you have somebody like Mr. Jackson doing a very clear, direct examination uh, of Dr. Harold. And I think they're very interested in forensic evidence. And again, it's to some extent what uh, Ms. Bodden said in her opening statement. It's the witness that doesn't have any me memory problems. It's the witness that doesn't have any bias or motive to make something up. It's really objective. And what the subjective part of forensic evidence is, is how each expert, be it for the prosecutors or the defense, interprets that evidence to be. Yeah, it's a good observation. Let me bounce around to a couple of different topics here with you, if I can, because as, as, as you know, live trials, I'm not sure exactly how often you and I are going to get to talk here. So as long as we've got some time, let's focus on a lot of different things. Um, Sarah Kaplan, that whole issue with her refusing to testify, the judge finding her in, a con in contempt and ordering her jailed again, so the viewers know that has been stayed, and they're supposed to get have, have some action in the appellate courts very soon here. Uh, firstly, were you surprised that the judge's ruling, the decision that says that this whole area is not privileged and confidential? I was not surprised. Um, again, one of the first things I learned in the DA's office, as well as something I've observed as a defense attorney, is you don't want to make yourself a witness to anything. Um, and here, um, I understand the proactive defense strategy is to be present with the defense experts, the forensic people, Dr. Lee, Dr. Bodden, whoever other, whoever other investigators they had out at the crime scene to collect evidence. But in that regard, you make yourself a witness to that type of evidence collection. Clearly what Ms. Um, Kaplan observed was inconsistent with what Dr. Lee said happened. And so that is not covered by attorney-client privilege. It is not a communication between the attorney and the client. And therefore, while it, it, it raises ethics issues about a defense attorney testifying against his own former client um, in the people's case in chief, I don't think there's a legal basis for doc, uh, the judge to prevent her or preclude her from testifying. And I think it's going to, uh, the Court of Appeal is going to be hard pressed to find a way to overrule what Judge Fiddler is ordering, namely that Sarah Kaplan must testify to her recipient of uh, observation of evidence gathering. Yeah, and I, I, I do agree with you, although I understand why the defense lawyers would want to be in control. I mean, as trial lawyers, as trial lawyers always want to be in control of the investigation, but as you said, the whole idea of of being there then runs that risk of, of, in fact, as we've seen in this situation here, you becoming a witness. Do you think, real quickly, we've got to hit a break in just a minute, Dimitri, do you think that, that this might tend to have defense lawyers, in about 30 seconds if you can, think twice about being at a crime scene like this? I definitely, uh, I it definitely, you know, right. raised a warning flag in my mind that in the future, uh, right. If I'm ever, I mean, I think all good trial lawyers have to go out to a crime scene 
Okay, and take yeah, a look but what you gotta, happened, as I said, but you gotta, not with the forensic Right, stay with us, Dimitri. We've got to take a quick break here. We'll be back for more of our coverage in just a few moments. Be right back.